Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do here on my channel. I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover are a little bit older. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if there's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. So we have reached the last video of December. And if you don't know what December is, you're new here, you didn't watch the previous ones this year or last year or the year before. December here on my channel is where every December I do a series where I just, for the entirety of the month, cover cases of John and Jane Doe's. Some of them being identified, some of them unfortunately still being unidentified to this day many, many years later. For the last case of December, we will be discussing a case that has been so requested for me to cover on my channel since even before she had been identified, but especially since her identification. This is a very, very tragic case, one that hopefully eventually will be completely solved. This is the case of Woodlawn Jane Doe, and for this one, we'll be taking it back to 1976. On Sunday, September 12th of 1976, at 1020 in the morning in Woodlawn, Baltimore County, Maryland, in the 5600 block of Dogwood Road, right near the back gate of the Lorraine Park Cemetery, the lifeless body of a girl was found. Unlike her fellow deceased nearby in the cemetery, she didn't have a name and wouldn't be buried by loved ones who knew her. Her story would become a mystery for many, many years to come. The way that she was found, it was pretty obvious right off the bat that she was a homicide victim. One wrapped in a white sheet with her hands tied behind her back with a rope. And the knot of this rope it was described as being high quality, like whoever tied the knot had some sort of prior experience tying knots because this knot, whoever did it, they had the skills to ensure that this knot would not be easily undone. Over this victim's face were three other cloth materials. The first was a blue and white bandana. The second was an orange and white bandana that had holes in it that perfectly fit the location of her eyes and nose. The third was a bag for grass seed that read Farm Bureau Association Grass Seed Lexington Mass, which is Massachusetts. Also, a piece of the bag was found lodged in her throat, and along with being strangled by some sort of a ligature, this had been her cause of death. Other than the asphyxiation and strangulation, she had also been badly beaten and intensely raped. She was so forcibly sexually assaulted that she had bled through the clothing she had been wearing on her bottom half. It is believed though that she had been injured, taken advantage of, and ultimately killed in a different location entirely, and then just dumped there for someone to eventually find her. She was guessed to be in her late teens or early 20s. At the very start of the case, they even guessed she could be up to 30 years old, but most did believe that she had been a teenager at her time of death. She stood between five feet, six inches tall and five feet, nine inches tall and weighed between 149 to 159 pounds. She had shoulder length, dark brunette hair with a prominent widow's peak. Her eyes were brown and she had a darker olive complexion. Her race did stump investigators at the time. They did believe her to be white with some Hispanic ancestry. She was wearing a white bra, a beige or off-white top, corduroy Levi jeans that were either beige or yellow, knee-high socks with multicolored stripes, and one single light tan moccasin with twine laces and a rubber sole was found near the remains and believed to have belonged to the victim. She had also been wearing a homemade necklace made of rawhide that had a turquoise bead on it. Her ears were pierced, but no earrings were found in her ears or near the body. In the right pocket of her jeans, they found a safety pin with two keys on it. One key believed to be a house key and the other believed to go to a deadbolt lock. 
She had a scar on her left thigh and a few more scars on her knees. She had an O positive blood type and she had extensive dental care done that included the removal of three of her molars and fillings in the remaining five. Teeth removal and fillings, of course, are not cheap to get done. So it was believed that she had come from a middle class or upper middle class family. It was also noted that one of her teeth was very crooked. She also had a tattoo that is widely described as being crude. It was on her upper right arm near her shoulder and it was difficult to make out exactly what it was but it seemed to be of two letters. Most people believe them to be JP, but other possible combinations guessed were JS, JD, JB, SP, SS, SD, or SB. As you can tell by the picture of the tattoo, it was very difficult to see what it said. Now they of course did a toxicology test to look for any traces of drugs in her system and the results for that were a little surprising. they found an extremely large dose in her system. And at that amount, it is believed to have been used as a sedative. Now, due to them finding this antipsychotic in her system, they believed that she or her killer may have had some sort of a link to a psychiatric facility. Also, remember the white sheet found wrapped around her body. It is very similar to the standard white blanket that you get while staying at a hospital. Antipsychotic medication and a hospital blanket, they believed a possible connection to an inpatient mental health unit, possibly somewhere in the area. And of course they looked into those and that didn't really get them anywhere in this case. This girl had no identification on her. She was a Jane Doe, one whose life was taken in a tragic way and her life ended far far too soon. Due to her being found in the area of Woodlawn, they decided to give her the name Woodlawn Jane Doe. And that is what she would be known as for the next 45 years in this case. The only information that came forward to the Baltimore County Police Department about who may have been in connection to this girl's murder was when they received a tip from a woman who had been on her way to church that Sunday morning, an hour before the remains had been found. And she said that she spotted a suspicious looking Ford Econoline van close to the area. That's all they really had and this got them nowhere, but it does make them wonder still today if possibly the van had been the vehicle used to transport the girl's remains to the location near the cemetery. Baltimore County Police had a murder to solve, but before they could solve that murder, they knew that their first step was to identify the victim of that murder. One of the first things they did was collect her fingerprints to keep on file and see if they matched anyone's on file eventually. She hadn't been deceased very long, so it was easy to collect solid fingerprints from this victim. They also collected dental information because back then, before DNA testing, really the main way they identified John and Jane Doe's was through dental records, considering everyone's dental chart is unique. These two things did not get them anywhere closer to finding out who she was. The fingerprints and dental records never matched up with anyone they looked into her possibly being. Many sketches of the victim were done through the years and these sketches were spread around with the hopes someone would come forward knowing who she was. No one knew the girl's real name. No one came forward knowing who she was. Where she came from was something everyone in the department and everyone who cared for the case wanted to know so desperately. Finding out where she had come from or where she possibly traveled through could have possibly got them one step closer to identifying her. They had to really take a look at the clues, what she had on her and what she had with her. She had the safety pin with the keys on it. Well, one of these keys had DB09212 stamped on it and authorities discovered the key had been made in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. But so many keys get made what lock did the key belong to? They didn't know. So they looked at the grass seed bag, which of course had the label on it, but just because it had a label from a certain location doesn't mean that it was manufactured in that exact location. So they wanted to know where it came from. They did find out that the bag was a few years old because the seed that came in the bag hadn't been produced in years, 
but it originally came from a factory in Buffalo, New York, and the seed had been distributed exclusively in five cities in Massachusetts. So, so far, they had two places at the top of their list, and that was New York and Massachusetts. And for quite a long time, those were really the two main places they thought she could have possibly come from. If she hadn't come from New York or Massachusetts, they definitely suspected she came from somewhere in the northeastern part of the United States. As DNA testing, though, became more commonly used and more advancements were being made in the field, they decided in the year of 2006 to take another look at her case and see if they could do something more. At the time, it didn't get them to where they needed to be, but at least they were able to say that DNA testing is the direction that they were going in, that maybe it was just going to take a little time. Nine years later, in the year of 2015, some new developments were made in this case. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children stepped in to help when it came to seeing, once again, where she may have come from. So they decided to do forensic pollen testing. If you're wondering what that is, they basically take pollen samples from evidence, mostly clothing, and see where that pollen may have come from. According to the Baltimore Sun, the testing was conducted by Andrew Lawrence of US Customs and Border Control. He vacuumed the victim's clothing and drew any grains out for further examination. They found traces of cedar, and mountain hemlock pollen. And the combination of these two are only found in two places. And that is the New York Botanical Garden and the Arnold Arboretum in Boston. A new reconstruction photo of the victim was released in 2015. This one done by forensic artist, Carl Koppelman. During that same year of 2015, the department received what they thought to be a very promising tip. They received word that their Jane Doe may have been a teenager of Puerto Rican or Colombian background that had moved from Puerto Rico to the Boston, Massachusetts area with her family when she was about six years old. This family was described as a larger family that she may have had as many as five siblings, believed to be two sisters and three brothers. The tip that came in even gave a possible explanation for her tattoo, which many thought was was the letters JP. It was said that the JP may have been the initials of Jamaica Plain, where the girl had lived in Boston. The tip that came in even gave a street that she may have lived on, which was Forbes Street, and schools that she could have attended. The tipster stated that the girl that they were referring to vanished when she was 15 years old, and police took this tip very, very seriously. I also have to mention that the Arnold Arboretum in Boston is not far from Jamaica Plain. So they were definitely thinking this may be where she came from and that this girl that the tipster was referring to may be their Jane Doe. The next year after that, which was 2016, based on that tip that we just talked about, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children did release to the public that this Jane Doe could have possibly went by the names Jasmine or Jazzy while alive and possibly came from relatives with the last names of Blanca, Tito, or Santana. They spread this new information to the public, hoping that it would go somewhere. 2016 was also the 40th anniversary of her murder. And this was really the time where everyone involved was sitting there like, it's been long enough. We need to get somewhere new with this. Due to this, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children would release another updated photo of the victim and release it to the public. There have been so many sketches done of Woodlawn Jane Doe through the years, more than I have probably seen in most other Doe cases, and I think it's partly due to the fact that she wasn't deceased long before she was found and it was clear to see what she most likely looked like while she was alive, even though she had been very badly beaten. The overall goal with reconstruction photos is to make the victim, who is of course dead, look as lively as possible because that is how people remember them who knew them while they were alive. It wouldn't be these photos though that would eventually solve this case. Through the years, there had been many missing girls from 
all over the country crossed off the list as possibly being this Jane Doe. One of the main ones being Mia Florence Injuris, who vanished, some suspected ran away from Norwalk, Connecticut on February 12th of 1976, which was seven months before Woodlawn Jane Doe was found. They did think for a while that she could have been her, even though Mia did have blue eyes and Woodlawn Jane Doe had brown. This was really one of those cases, and we talk about these type of cases all the time here on my channel, where they really just had to wait for advancements in technology to get them anywhere promising. And that advancement in this case being genetic genealogy, aka the thing I discuss most here on my channel. If you don't know what that is, genetic genealogy is taking a person's DNA, creating a DNA profile, putting that DNA into a genetic database, finding familial DNA, sometimes mapping out an entire family tree, and discovering who an unknown killer was or who a John or Jane Doe was in life. With this case in particular, authorities have been a little private when it comes to some aspects. They have not released to the public exactly how the process was done when it came to this case, but the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, with the help of Bode Technology, which is a laboratory in Virginia that does forensic DNA analysis, and Othram, which is a corporation specializing in forensic genealogy, finally identified Woodlawn Jane Doe just last year, and her identity was released to the public on September 15th, 2021. Woodlawn Jane Doe was 16-year-old Margaret Federolf. She was born on December 27th of 1959, and she wasn't from Massachusetts or New York. She came from Alexandria, Virginia, which is an area roughly 50 miles southwest of where she was found in Woodlawn, Maryland. Family members of hers did describe her, though, as a habitual runaway. That she went missing during the summer of 1975, that's when her sister last saw her, and they did report her missing at the time and always wondered what happened to her and why she never reached out. Of course, now they know why. Her brother Edward was quoted by WCVB saying, in my eyes, she never grew up. Going on to say he kind of always had suspected the worst. When it comes to where this case stands right now, they know her identity, finally, but who killed her? That is what they are trying to find out right now. Baltimore County Police Corporal Downa Carter says that they are going to be going back to where she originally came from. They're going to be talking to friends and classmates. She had been attending Hayfield Secondary School when she ran away, and they want to see if anyone has any information to give forward. They want to know who she hung around with and who she may have left with if she did leave the area with somebody. They are asking anyone from the public anyone at all with any information about Margaret's case to please contact the Baltimore County Police Department at 410-307-2020. And remember that you can stay anonymous. So that is the case of Woodlawn Jane Doe. We now thankfully know her as Margaret Federolf. And I just hope that maybe this next year, a full conclusion to this case will emerge. This is one of those Doe cases that I definitely followed for a while. I remember when she was identified and a lot of people were like flooding my emails and my Instagram and everything, telling me to do a video about it, but I kind of wanted to give it a little bit of time to see if more information came out about her or see if they were close to solving her murder in full, but I decided that I really wanted to keep her video for the last video of December and really the last video of the year. Thank you all for taking a little bit of time out of your day to hear about Margaret's case. It is an extremely heartbreaking one. So like always, please, please leave any kind comments, any love to her family down below in the comments if they do stumble across this video. And with all that being said, thank you all for a great year on my channel. It was not an easy year and I'm sure that you all can tell that by the inconsistencies in my uploading, but I really hope to make y'all a little proud in this coming year and upload a lot more regularly. I will see you all in 2023. I hope you all have an incredible and very, very safe New Year's Eve and New Year.